Hello again, this is Corey Collins with the Keller Church of Christ, continuing our study, Dependable Discipleship, the letters of 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. During this session, we'll be in Titus chapter 2. You may open your Bible there. One of the most thrilling and exciting and favorite passages of mine in all the New Testament, because it talks about adorning the doctrine making God's truth attractive by living it out every day in a very practical, instructive way. This part of God's word will help us learn what it means to show Jesus to the world by our conduct. So with your Bible open there, we're going to uh, begin And notice as we start, the resources we mention each time, this is a new spot for the teaching blog. If you'll note servingandsharing.com, they're in the middle of the screen. At uh, the top, uh, you have these video lessons. There's another series I'm doing called Digging for Gold, How to Study the Bible for Yourself. And then you may also contact the Keller Church and tell us uh, how we may be of insistence and encouragement to you. We're going to call this chapter Declare Sound Doctrine. In the last verse, 15, these things exhort with all authority and declare and let no one disregard you. Coming up next, we have a change in what we had announced before. Starting June 7th, we'll be in 1st and 2nd Peter, and we hope you'll be part of that discussion. And also, if you find something helpful, share it with others through social media and invite your friends to uh, take part in our class also. Book of Titus, sometimes overshadowed, uh, I guess, in some studies by the letters to Timothy. We don't know as much about Titus. We only have these three chapters and some information in Galatians and in Corinthians. We introduced him last time and noted he's actually very significant in the spread of the gospel in the first century. Some years ago in 2003, Tanya and I were in Florence, Alabama, working with a congregation and taking part in a mission outreach that involved sprucing up people's homes. And I preached a sermon based on that that I called Weapons of Mass Construction because everyone was talking about Iraq and destruction and all of that. And I showed this slide at the church and I said, would you believe this house, look at it and then notice what you see next? Well, they were all impressed because they thought I was showing them a before and after of the same house. But then I actually admitted to them, I said, it's not the same house. And we had a smile about that. I had played a little trick on them. The fact is, when you look at before and after, you think about the fact that so often you see what people do with houses on some kind of fixer upper type program where you see how it starts out and then they have the great unveiling and wow, you can't believe it really is the same place. Well, that compares so much to what we see in Titus 2 and all of the gospel message that Jesus Christ, his grace, his power, his truth, not only redeem us, but reform us, renew us, restore us, so that if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creature. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we're not what we used to be. We have been raised with Christ in our baptism, and now the world should be able to detect in all that we do the difference that Jesus makes in our lives and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God living in our hearts. So our goal is to point people toward heaven. And the church, if you think of us as God's people, forming a gigantic arrow so that others can see Jesus Christ in our lives and be persuaded, be attracted, be drawn to the truth, partly by the way we adorn the doctrine. If you look at Titus 2 and verse 10. 
So throughout this series, we've been putting the overlay of mission, that what we're learning is not simply academic or just for our own sakes, it's certainly going to make us better people and improve our marriages, our families, and the congregations to which we belong. But God saves us and uses us to save others. We are taught so we can teach. We are blessed so we can bless. We are forgiven so that we can forgive and help others find forgiveness in Christ. So here we are in Titus chapter 2 with some ideas we might think about, and if we were together, we would discuss. Let's begin the chapter. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. That's how we took our title for this chapter. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They're to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Let's pause there for a moment and think about two major concerns in this chapter. Behave because. These ideas are so intertwined that from verse to verse, you'll see a very clear and emphatic uh, word of direction, how we are to conduct ourselves, and then you'll see something that follows it, that here's a reason for it. So, for example, notice that uh, these young women are to be taught to live a certain way, and then the end of verse 5, why? So that the word of God may not be reviled. In other words, there won't be critics who can justly find fault with the word of God based on what they see in the lives of young Christian women. So we can't stress enough whether we're older men like I am, older women, younger people, whoever we might be, we must walk in a way that affirms, that asserts, that clarifies the message of God. And so we're going to behave this way because. The next thing that we might notice is, as for you, notice the word but. Why is it there? Well, if you go back to the preceding chapter, here we learned about those false teachers that profess to know God, but deny them by their works. But you, you're not to be like that, Titus. Previously, these men are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work, but you, Titus, not that way. And so they were spoken of as defiled and unbelieving, their minds and consciences uh, corrupted. They uh, were lazy and liars and lazy beasts and uh, gluttons. And so chapter two begins with this contrast. And sometimes when we divide the Bible like we do, which are man-made chapter uh, numbers, we miss the background and that what's coming now builds on that. A similar contrast, 2 Timothy 3, you remember a few weeks ago, that the world may become worse and worse and worse as the last days continue. But you, man of God, Timothy, continue in the things that you've learned and you've been convinced of. So this word but is very important and leads us to ask ourselves, what distinguishes us from hypocrites? from professing religious people that may not be what they need to be, what shows us to be genuine? Well, the word doctrine, very interesting. Many times it makes us think of something regarding baptism. You know, what's the right doctrine, the true teaching about the church, the one church that belongs to the Lord or worship, how we sing and pray in the Lord's Supper, the first day of every week. Sometimes we hear doctrine, and we think first of those very important and critical and essential elements. But here in Titus 2, 
the doctrine refers to morality, character, attitudes, lifestyle. And so I want to emphasize as strongly as I can that doctrine includes both ideas. Yes, those matters that relate to the pattern of the church and the leadership and uh, the way that we are to do things, thus says the Lord. But sound or healthy doctrine also teaches us who we are to be. And if you think about it, the one kind of doctrine without the other is not complete. And if the two contradict, if we say, well, we are the Lord's church because we do these things related to worship and conversion and so forth, the name of the church, the names we wear, but we don't live the life, people will see that disparity and not be attracted. So we want to adorn the doctrine. That's where we headed, we're headed. And so a sound doctrine, we want to remember, is referring here to, to who we are. Then I noticed that uh, older men, verse two, this is the same Greek word that if it's talking specifically about elders, it will be rendered in your English Bible as elders. But in this generic sense, presbyteros is the word. It refers to any one male who is relatively older than the others. So I am an older man, but I'm not an elder in the specific sense that we read in Titus chapter one, but this is for all older men and qualities that we are to have. So there are four traits that I must strive for, and you also, if you're at this point in life, and notice what they are, sober-minded and dignified, self-controlled and sound. I am to be, as a godly man, serious and mature and solid. I am to carry myself and to present myself as one who uh, is focused on Christ. I'm not to be silly. I'm not to be uh, light uh, and treat Christianity as if it's just an easygoing thing, sober-minded, alert clear-headed. Uh, I'm not going to involve myself in alcohol or anything that would dull my sobriety. Dignified suggests, again, respectable, uh, uh, holding oneself in a way that, that others can recognize and, and somewhat look up to. Self-controlled. I'm not going to be um, uh, a glutton. I'm not going to uh, be loose with my money or my time or my energy or my effort. This is the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, self-control. And sound, once again, meaning healthy. Then in that word sound, there are three ways that we who are older are to be sound. Faith, knowing the book trusting what God has spoken, putting our confidence, our whole weight on this message. Sound in love. Again, not pretended, not simply in word, but in deed and in truth, genuine and real. Let love be without hypocrisy, Romans 12, 9. And in steadfastness, that is stability, endurance, perseverance. What do we need to see in our older men? Faith, love, steadfastness. We need to see men that are sober, men that are serious, men that are dignified, and men that have these characteristics that show a strong, uh, self-control, diligent, dedicated example. Now, next we notice women, and uh, women are not elders, and yet older women have qualities to which our sisters must aspire. And here they are, reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to much wine, 
uh, these are the things likewise. Notice that word likewise. Here are the men, and then in a similar way, reverent, that is once again, sober-minded, dignified, respectable, treating holy things as holy, having absolute uh, adoration toward God, and in worship, knowing who God is and displaying that in, in a woman's life. Not slanderers. Some Bibles may say not malicious gossips. In fact, there's a Greek word from which we get the word devil and we get the word diabolical that's used sometimes of uh, human speech that we're not to participate in. The, the devil is the number one gossip. He is the backbiter. He's the insulter. He's the one that wants to find fault with us and tell everybody else about it. We're not to be that way. Gossip is a terrible sin. Many, if not all of us, have engaged in it. We think uh, for some reason it's going to benefit us. It's as wrong as anything else in the, in the Bible. And then this not slaves to much wine. What does that mean? Well, the Bible warns us about the addictive nature of alcohol. And we already saw in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that Timothy himself was not a drinker at all. He abstained. And so Paul had to tell him, it's okay to take a little bit of wine medically for health reasons, for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. And so the Bible cautions us uh, to, to be aware of the danger of alcohol. Now, what's the job description for all older women? Not just elders' wives, not just preachers' wives, but all older women are to teach what is good and to train the young women. Well, in what ways? What's the curriculum? What do we want our young sisters to be and to do? Well, it's very clear. You are an effective, young servant of Christ, ladies, if you're married, if you love your husbands and your children, if you're self-controlled, if you're pure, you work at home, you're kind and submissive to your own husbands. You know, I love that list because it's so obviously true. It's thus says the Lord, but also because it's so simple. And I think many people, not just young women, but all of us men as well, we sometimes, life can be so, uh, we make it so complicated. There are a thousand things we need to do that we think are necessary for us to be significant or valued or appreciated. And so we're constantly running this wheel. Again, I'm talking about myself and all of us, trying to get one more thing, accomplish something else. And and, and our checklist just grows and grows and grows, and we beat ourselves up because we're conscientious. We know we don't get it all done. And I think for young people, this can be especially difficult. And so what if you just had a checklist of six things, and you said, if I'm doing this, I know I'm pleasing God. I love my husband. I love my children. I'm self-controlled. Talked about that a few moments ago with the men. I'm pure in heart. I truly want what God wants from our life. I'm working at home, providing a nice home for my family. I'm kind. I'm not rude. I'm not sarcastic. I'm not impatient and mean. And I'm in submission. I'm supporting my husband. I identify him as the head of my home. And I am happy to be in the role that I have. Well, where do younger women learn these things? From older women. And for that reason, it's so important that we recognize all older women have the opportunity, the privilege, and the responsibility to impress these matters upon those that are younger. Uh, why? Well, uh, uh, because this is God's design, God's plan, like mothers in a home with their daughters. I know some will say that not all young women want to be mentored, and not all older women are willing to take on this task. But that's why we have Titus chapter 2 to tell us that 
This is something God expects of us. This is what he has taught us. And it's not simply a matter of what we feel comfortable to do. We learn to do that which God has commanded us to do. Now let's go on and notice the reason given. We noted this briefly a moment ago. When younger women live the way that pleases God, when older men and older women do the same, honoring God in the, uh, the spots that we have in life, the word of God is not reviled. Now, you and I see all over the news from time to time, some religious leader, perhaps a televangelist or someone that's well known for their writing or their teaching, there will be a contradiction between that and the way they handle money or relationships or the opposite sex, and the media will go wild. And the media will revile the word of God because those that are professing Christians are not living the life. Now, we're not perfect. We're not saying that. But our faithful determination to serve according to the word of God prevents attacks that are unnecessary that might come from the enemy. And we'll see this again as we continue. So what about younger men? It's very interesting. Only one exhortation is given here, and that is self-control. And I know, having been a young man, and many of these things uh, are temptations for men all our lives, but self-control. Don't think what you shouldn't think. Don't desire that which you shouldn't. Don't let lust enter into your heart. Uh, don't look at pornography. Don't entertain immoral ideas and interest. And of course, this carries on over also to money and time and worship and Bible study and prayer. You can learn, young men, to control yourself when you're young. You'll be blessed all your life. And then the preacher. I have to emphasize here because notice what's said in verse 7. Show yourself in all respects to be a model. Remember 1 Timothy 4, 12, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but be an example to the believers. Now, Titus is never told that he's young, like Timothy. He may be farther along in years, but the principle is still the same. Good works in your teaching, integrity, dignity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. And so in my role, Here's a passage spoken directly to me, but to all who present the word of God, who are leaders in the church in particular ways. In all respects, that is my whole life, needs to be something of an open book. And it is, we ministers talk about living in the fishbowl and the pressures it puts on us and our wives and our children that basically our lives are exposed well, in a sense, that's a very good thing because when we know that other people can see who we are and what we truly uh, uh, intend to practice, it can help as a restraint, help give us a reminder to, to avoid those traps that the devil would want to uh, pull us into. So in teaching, isn't it interesting? In teaching, we usually say teach the truth, and that's right. That's right. But notice integrity, integrity of character. Uh, I believe it's John Maxwell that says people buy into the leader before they buy into his leadership. Before they'll listen to what a person has to say, they must be convinced that this person is worth listening to. It's not about the preacher. It's about the word of God but the preacher is the vessel through whom the message comes. So integrity, dignity, sound speech, healthy, solid, biblical, real, true, relevant. Why? Well, speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Do you see why I'm calling this chapter Behave Because? Here we see it again. First, we saw with the younger 
women, that the word of God might now be reviled, live this way. Now we see it with Titus. This, there's this opponent. There's someone out there waiting to take down a preacher and find some flaw, some fatal error, some moral defect, and then broadcast it to the world and say, see this Christianity stuff, it's not real, it's not true, look what so-and-so did, it's written these books, put these sermons online, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, here's the behave, the cause. So what happens if the preacher is not an example of a genuine man of God, what does that do to him? It destroys his soul. He's living a lot. What does it do to his family? How many marriages uh, have broken up because of hypocrisy from uh, the man? And what does it do to the church if the church puts their confidence in this person and then they find out that he's, he's a fraud? So well, enough said about that. Now, let's go to bond slaves. And we've mentioned before in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that the Bible does not recommend the mistreatment or abuse or disrespect of any other human being. And there were elements in bond service in New Testament times that weren't parallel to the kind of slavery that you and I know historically to be an awful thing because of the way it degrades human beings and treats them as property or as objects. So there were those in New Testament times for various reasons that had put themselves under the yoke of servitude to someone else. And so the Bible tells those in that situation how to behave and why. And so the fact is, where they might be resentful and resistant and upset and argumentative and critical and quarrelsome, instead, by their submission to their masters, notice in everything, by their being well-pleasing and not pilfering, not cheating, not embezzling, by their showing good faith, what would they accomplish? Well, here it is again behave because, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. This principle is so pivotal. It is so fundamental to our effort in mission to take the gospel to our families and our neighbors and our friends and our co-workers. We want to act in such a way so that in everything we do, I want to refer you to Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So here's the bond servant, but it refers to the employee. It refers to the hourly wage earner. It refers to the person that takes a job doing anything for anybody for any purpose. Submit to your boss. Please your boss. Don't argue. Don't pilfer. Show good faith and adorn the doctrine. Now, I want to talk about this word adorn as a word study because it comes from a Greek term that we use to take the word cosmetics. You can see cosmeo there. Cosmetics is that which beautifies or makes more attractive. It's used in the Bible of how the Pharisees would um, adorn the tombs of those that had gone before. It's used of the evil spirit that left a man and then he came back and brought other companions with him and found the house all beautified, the, the, the life he was going to attack again. Um, it was used in Revelation 21, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven like a bride adorned, you see, beautified for her husband. It's used uh, when we're warned, or ladies are warned, especially against outward adornment being the priority. First Peter 3, 5 talks about that, then 1 Timothy 2, 9. 
And so this principle that we're not primarily interested in what we look like on the outside so that people would be drawn to us based on our physical appearance. Now, apply that to what God does say, and that is adorn God's truth and let people want to see it and know it and hear it and learn it because of the way you live. Matthew 25, when the, the wise bridesmaids trimmed their lamps, they adorned them, they made them beautiful by bringing them to light. So the Bible has other things to teach to Christian slaves, but these things apply to all Christians because we work our professions, we show up at the office or the classroom, wherever we might be. So I want you to ask yourself, what are you doing right now in your sphere, your Monday through Friday or whatever? Uh, what are you doing there to make God's doctrine beautiful? Is there something about your demeanor, your integrity, your dignity, your sobriety, all these things we've talked about, your humility, your, your willingness to smile on your face, your eagerness to do a great job. And of course, the opposite of that would defile the Lord's doctrine. If we are critical, if we cut the job short, if we talk about our boss behind their back, think of all the things you wouldn't want in an employee. And those are the things that God does not allow us to do or be in, in a work setting, especially. But you also adorn or defile the doctrine in your marriage, in your work with the church, in your worship, in your Bible study, with your money, with your time, and so forth. Well, now we're going from the behave to the because. Look at verses 11 through 15. Why are we to adorn the doctrine and live the way we do? Verse 11, for or because the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace of God, it redeems us. It also reforms us. Often we think of the grace that God provides as the free gift of eternal life, and it is. But have you ever thought of grace as an instructor? Uh, training, equipping, disciplining us. Let's notice that salvation is available for all people. This is the fault of Calvinism, which teaches that God pre-selected a few, and he only loved the few enough to send Jesus to die for them and to save them, and the rest of humanity, according to Calvinism, God does not love enough to send Jesus and provide salvation. So at the same time, not all people will be saved. Why not? Because not everyone will respond to the grace of God. We're saved by grace through faith when we repent and are baptized. By grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Well, if a person doesn't have faith, that person doesn't take hold of the free gift. It's still a free gift. We don't earn it. God initiated it. God set it there for us. Uh, if you want to say God put it like low-hanging fruit, but unless we reach up and take it, it will not be ours. So here are the ways that grace disciplines us. We refuse those things that don't fit the character of God. We determine that passions that are ungodly and unholy we will not have anything to do with them. We will live the same way the beginning of the chapter told us. These two ideas are intermingled. Behave because. Here's the behave again. Self-controlled, upright, godly. See how they're so mixed. You can't separate the doctrine. Jesus gave his life to redeem us. The, that doctrine from the moral doctrine. They're, they're built one built on the other. So uh, 
Jesus is coming again. There's a blessed hope. Um, he is uh, our God and Savior. He is full deity. He gave his life to redeem us, we read here, also to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Look at verse 14. We are possessed by Jesus Christ. Now think of the Bible era and people that were possessed by demons and those demons took over their speech and their appearance and uh, their activities. Well, so it is for, for us being possessed by Jesus Christ. He owns every part of you and me. If we are his from head to toe, from the inside out, the hands, the feet, everything that we are. And this is how we know, because we reject ungodliness and worldly passions because we're self-controlled and we're upright and we're living godly lives. Upright meaning straight, pointing vertically toward God. So, verse 15, what should the preacher preach? Notice how the chapter closes. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. So Titus, Timothy, Corey, you preachers, anyone who would present the gospel of Jesus Christ, do it with conviction with assurance, with affirmation that I know this is true. And I am telling you what God has said. The authority comes from him and not from me. I don't want to overlook, and perhaps I did, look again at the end of verse 14 before we leave this. Zealous for good works. Zealous suggests on fire, bubbling, boiling, burning over. And this introduces what's coming in chapter 3, as we'll see again and again and again, that Jesus owns the people who have a zeal, a drive, an eagerness to do what is good. And I meant to say that's what identifies you and me as belonging to Christ. Someone says, hey, what do you know about so-and-so? Well, I'll tell you what, they're always looking to do something good. They're positive. They have focus. They have direction in their lives. So what does the preacher preach? That's what the preacher preaches. Behave because. A simple two-part message that I need to hear again, and likely you feel the very same way. If this message has been helpful to you, would you please make a point to share this YouTube channel and the other resources that are available through the Keller Church and through the contact information that we gave you at the very beginning? We are standing on the Word of God. We want everyone to hear it and know it, follow it, teach it, live it, and one day be saved by it. Because our blessed hope is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the reason we behave as we do. That's why we are who we are. And that's the focus and the intent of our lives. We want to adorn the doctrine that the word of God may not be reviled, that the opponent may be put to shame and have nothing bad, legitimate to say about us. So that the preacher and the preaching of the word of God will not be disregarded or disparaged. 
thank you so much for joining us. Once again, I'm Corey Collins with the Keller Church of Christ. I'd be so happy to hear from you. And we continue to meet next time, Lord willing, Titus chapter 3. I look forward to that study with you. God bless you until then.